today, we're going to have a, a quick look at um, how the role of the urban planner is actually changing in Scotland in the context of climate change. Um, much of my experience has uh, been in the public sector, so I'm probably going to take a more policy public sector based approach to look at this, and then we'll lead on to Rhiannon, who's going to look at things uh, from the more of a, a private sector perspective. Um, so, yeah, thanks for the previous presentation as well. That really did set the scene about um, the sustainability development goals and the Paris Climate Agree Agreement. Um, I just wanted to talk about those, though, in the context of planning um, as well. I mean, first of all, I think uh, when you think about urban plan, it might not be obvious the role that we have or that we should have when dealing with climate-related issues. In relation to the sustainability goals and the Paris Agreement, um, planners have a key role to play across the board, I would argue. Specifically, um, if you were looking at sustainability goals, goal 11 probably is the, the more um, relevant one for us. But as I mentioned, I think planning is actually far reaching than that. Um, and if we're planning and designing cities properly, then good urban planning can have a positive impact on, on all the goals, actually. And in relation to the Paris Agreement, um, well, I don't need to emphasize the importance of that, but I think step two probably is where planners have a, a, a real crucial role to play. Um, and I also thought it'd be worth mentioning at this point, um, Scotland's new purpose for planning, which was recently defined in the new um, Planning Scotland Act 2019, which is um, bringing in radical new changes to the planning system in Scotland. Um, but alongside those radical changes has been a much more simplified purpose of planning. Um, and the purpose of planning is to manage uh, the development and use of land in the long-term public interest. So very broad ranging. Um, and I think planners have got a key role to, to play here across the board. Just moving on. Sorry. So how are we working towards achieving these goals then um, and the Paris Agreement? Well, I want to look just at a few examples, first of all, um, because I think a lot of good stuff is going on um, in Scotland and beyond. I think it's fair to say that we are developing strategies and frameworks that um, help us to innovate better with um, concepts like sustainable urban drainage systems, particularly in urban areas, as well as natural infrastructure as solutions to some of our big problems. Um, we're also developing strategies for urban nature-based solutions. Um, that's, uh, Joe mentioned there in the introduction, one of my main tasks at the moment, my current project is developing the and delivering the open space strategy, taking a nature-based solutions approach to the city of Glasgow, um, one of the one of the key one of the main components of that is we're trying to improve and enhance biodiversity in the city too. We see that as a key goal. Um, but another example that I wanted to uh, briefly mention here too, which is maybe a bit about left wing example for for planners, but it's something that I've been leading on over the last maybe twelve months or so, um, and that is the, the development of the new and Scotland first actually nature based enterprise accelerator. Um, this is a program that we've developed to encourage nature-friendly enterprises um, across the city of Glasgow uh, who are using or will be using nature in a fundamental way to provide a product or service, but also in line with um, the city's open space strategy. Um, and the reason for that is because we want to involve not just public sector and third sectors, but also to develop private sector enterprise as well and helping us to maintain and encourage um, nature-based solutions across the city of Glasgow. So I wanted to bring in that example because it's something that maybe the planners don't do on a day-to-day -day basis, but in terms of the direction of urban planning these days, these are the sorts of innovative ideas and concepts that we're now starting to see planning introduced. Um, so I would say that there's positive signs um, in terms of the direction of travel, particularly with uh, Scotland's new National Planning Framework 4, which um, is in production. We haven't got the draft yet, but I understand that it's imminent. Um, and that talks a lot about uh, natural infrastructure and planning for nature-based solutions. Uh, we, can, we know that because we've seen the position statement so far. And before we uh, move on, I just also wanted to mention that the Royal Town Planning Institute itself as an institute uh, is also uh, taking a lot of action to, to make sure that the institute ourselves are uh, operating on a net zero basis by 2025. So just looking at a couple more examples, actually, as well, and this is a, a, a really important one, particularly in Scotland, because we are just embarking on a digital transformation of the planning system. Uh, and in the context of climate, that actually has a, has a big impact. 
um, you can see here some of these um, the diagrams, the one in, in the middle in particular, the digital planning in Scotland is expected to cross-sector reach. Um, so not just looking at planning and building and development, but actually reaching across the board, uh, looking at social, economic and environmental factors as well. And we're hoping to um, draw out a whole range of climate-friendly benefits from that. And I'll just run through some of those quickly just now, because again, I think urban planning maybe isn't always seen as the facilitator for such change. Um, so I think it's important to highlight some of these. With digital planning, um, we hope that this will lead to lower energy demand um, from the ability to use better data and engagement to plan for efficient accessibility between homes and jobs, for example, and also to increase density where it's appropriate to do so. Uh, also, better integrated and local energy supplies. I'll look at an example, a specific example about that in a minute, um, but from the ability to use better spatial data and engagement with the private sector, communities and uh, statutory consultees to inform the efficient development of generation and supply in relation to new and existing communities. Uh, also, the digital transformation of the planning system could lead to lower transport demand and emissions from better placemaking that encourages modal shifts uh, and from planning for improved accessibility that lowers non-active transport requirements. The ability to support the achievement of incoming building regulations, which is another really important one because uh, planning and building regulations often work very well together, but there are some areas of friction perhaps, um, and I think that the digital transformation of the planning system will help to uh, to relieve some of those issues. Uh, reducing emissions of individuals and communities via behavioural changes too, so through placemaking and planning that encourages sustainable ways of living, working and socially engaging with communities too. Um, in my own project too, there's a couple of examples where we're using data, for example, to better plan for community spaces across the city of Glasgow by uh, using a whole range of data sets, social, economic and environmental, and also applying some um, accessibility software, which helps us analyse where people live in the city. The top diagram there shows um, the accessibility of some of the key um, community spaces that we hope to bring forward in the, in the coming months. So there's a lot going on um, with just those examples. These are two more examples in particular. Um, I mentioned a minute ago about uh, energy and heat. Uh, my colleagues at Green Space Scotland have been working to develop a, a project called Green Heat in Green Spaces. Um, this is an amazing project, actually, which has managed to collect a whole range of really useful and viable data in relation to the potential to provide um, heat sources below our open spaces. Um, that's open spaces across the whole of Scotland. It's a, an emerging data set. Some of it's publicly available already, but more will become publicly available soon. Basically, the data analyzes all open spaces and uh, gives us an indication of their potential to be able to provide heat to the nearby buildings and facilities around parks, for example, but also rivers and other blue spaces too. Um, in Glasgow, we are working at the moment to try and integrate this into the open space strategy so we can um, allow better uh, informed use of our open spaces and, and maximise that potential. Um, so the other uh, project here that I was quickly going to mention is a, park, is a project in London called Go Parks. Um, it's developed by the Greater London Authority and uh, the National Park City Foundation and others too. Um, basically, it provides a really comprehensive look at all open spaces and green spaces in London. Uh, you can, um, it's very intuitive. You can just log on, have a look at the um, different spaces in London, click on them, and it gives you a whole variety of information. So um, how you can access those spaces by using active travel, for example, um, what sorts of biodiversity and, and ecology might exist within those spaces, and also um, how uh, communities can get involved in local activities that are happening or how they can develop friends of groups, for example, too. Um, they've also worked in collaboration with uh, the boroughs for councils in, in London to just develop this. So another good example, I think, where data uh, is uh, being led within the context of planning to allow us to develop more sustainable communities. Uh, I'm going to just end here uh, on some of the challenges that we're facing because it's not all, um, unfortunately, it's not all positive. Um, there, there, there are many things that we need to overcome as a profession um, and as a society, I suppose, as well. Resourcing being the key one. Um, training as well. Some of this is quite technical and not all planners have that uh, technical skill set yet. So there is a, a bit of a, a gap there that we need to fill. 
Um, the pace of policy change too, unfortunately, the pace of policy change, policy change can be slower and particularly slower than the effects of climate change. So that's something that we need to catch up with. Also convincing decision makers of the benefits of good planning and including all this data and engagement and doing it properly. And one last thing too is that market and uh, land values and cost. Um, there are so many examples of where we have all the ingredients to have a great nature-based solution on the ground, but sometimes land value makes uh, that prohibitive, for example, uh, or the cost of constructing um, some renewable heat from, from the ground can, can be a huge barrier. But I want to end, end on one um, um point of hope, I suppose. This picture here is the network that Rihanna and I represent, uh, this is the steering group, and I think that a lot of the changes that are going to come, particularly hopefully from some amazing agreement that will come from Glasgow um, next month, you know, this is the generation, I think, that are going to take on this challenge, and I feel confident knowing who we represent that we are up for that task. So, um, and uh, on that note, I'm going to pass over to uh, Rihanna to take us a step further in that direction. Thanks, Thanks, John. Thank that was uh, good. some motivating words at the end there. Um, I'm just <laughs> going to quickly share my screen. Um, if you just give me a second to get the presentation up. Hopefully that's sharing just now. I'm not hearing otherwise, so I'm just going to start. Um, oh, sorry, so firstly, yeah, we can't hear you. Not, yeah. not just yet. No? Okay. Let's see. I knew this would happen to me. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Um, so firstly, I just want to say thanks to Joe for the introductions and thanks, Sean, as well. It's amazing to see the ways in which technology and data are informing spatial, pal spatial planning. Um, as Joe and Sean said, my name is Rhiannon Moylan. I'm a senior planner at Montague Evans and I co-chair the Scot Scottish Young Planners Network with Sean. Today, I'm going to briefly discuss the concept of 20-minute neighbourhoods and the role this policy will have in planning's future. In the past few years, a new term is emerging in planning policy, 20-minute neighbourhoods. The 20-minute neighbourhood strategy centres on the principle that residents would have access to services they need, workplaces, schools, shops, healthcare and leisure facilities within a 20-minute radius from their home. While the idea of localism has been high on the agenda in recent years, it's only since the coronavirus pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns that people have begun to explore and appreciate their local communities. As people begin to understand the importance of having access to key services and facilities nearby, especially in difficult times, the term 20-minute neighbourhoods continued to grow in significance. In Scotland, the term rose to prominence when the National Planning Framework 4 position paper was published. This identified that creating 20-minute neighbourhoods would be a key opportunity that could help Scotland achieve its net zero goals and contribute to the fight against climate change. The focus for 20-minute neighbourhoods is on creating sustainable communities. It's not purely about the proposed use or supporting the economic role of a place. It's instead about creating healthy, sustainable places to live. To do so, the strategy is centred on sustainable travel. The 20 minute radius is calculated based on the time it takes to walk or cycle to key services. Being closer to key amenities promotes active travel over cars and aims to reduce journey times and the need for regular commuting. Secondly, the prior priority is on neighbourhoods and communities. It is a people focused model which focuses on the health and well being of the neighbourhood and those who live within it. We've all come to appreciate our neighbourhoods more in the past 18 months and in some cases understand where and what it may be lacking and we are more aware of the necessity to ensure our places meet the needs of our local communities. Promoting the 20-minute neighbourhood strategy will help to ensure new development is sustainably located next to existing assets and transport links, while promoting healthy communities and increasing local access to key services and community hubs, which will help reduce the need to travel. Community benefits aside, planning policies that focus on sustainability will play a huge role in ensuring that we embed resilience to climate change in future decision making. We are seeing more and more local authorities encouraging investigations into the potential links to create new heat networks and for larger de developments to create their own heat networks. There's also a strong policy push for new developments to incorporate low and zero carbon technologies. 
While a lot of this will largely come through building control legislation and the soon to be updated regulations, plan and policy can also use to be utilised to ensure that new development considers resource management and the long term sustainability of buildings. Emerging policies, including the 20 minute neighbourhood policy approach, look to utilise existing assets and land. This considers both the reuse of existing buildings and the brownfield land to help create a circular economy and reduce embed carbon, embedded carbon. This is a key planning tool in our, in our response to climate change. And planning will be a key in Scotland's aim for a green recovery. Planning shapes everything we do and aims to create sustainable places to live, work and play. It's essential that measures to adapt and built in mitigation measures to reduce climate change are embedded within planning policy. So how will planning help to encourage sustainable solutions? We need to continue to build on the work that's been done and to adapt to changing technologies and welcome new science to help build sustainable communities. As John said, planning can often planning policy can also be slow in adapting to new technologies, so we need to make sure there's built-in flexibility <clears throat> within our policy approach. Planning seeks to create great places, and to do this, we must adapt and respond to emerging issues and technologies to ensure we deliver places and that new developments meet the needs of not only the current generation, but of future generations.